friends, Christianity in the world is under siege. Or more accurately, Christians of authentic faith are under siege. And maybe that's why when we look at the map at where true persecution is taking place, it's happening on the other side of the world because in many ways, this is where a lot of the authentic faith is happening. Places like Syria and Iraq, Egypt, down to the Sudan, and of course China and India, the Philippines, these are just some of the places where real persecution is taking place right now in the world. Did you know more Christians die every day for being Christian than any other time in history? We're living in unique times right now. And yet here on, in the West, are we even aware of it? We rarely ever hear about such things because the media doesn't want to cover it. And even when we do hear about it, I've come to the conclusion that maybe we don't care because our brothers and sisters are dying. Our brothers and sisters are being pillaged. They're being raped. They're being tortured. They're being martyred all over the world every day. Notice that Satan, though, hasn't used that tact in the West. That's been mostly on the east side of the, the planet. You know, I was thinking of some examples of this taking place. And one that comes to mind is one I read uh, just recently, and it happened a couple years ago. And that is a group of Egyptian Christians decided to go out to a distant monastery where they could pray. And they rented a couple of buses and they set out for this monastery. On their way, they were stopped by some very radical Islamic terrorists. And they boarded the buses with their guns, but they didn't shoot right away. Instead, what they did is they started to pull people out of the bus and interrogated each one. They would ask two questions. First question, are you a Christian? The second question, will you convert to Islam? Two opportunities, really, for these Christians to save their lives. And if you think about it, I wonder what would happen if this question were brought to us in the West with the same situation. But they brought them out. The first question, are you a Christian? It seems easy enough to imagine saying, no. It's just one syllable. No. You, you could even not believe it as you say it. No. And then the next question, though, will you convert to Islam? It's still just one syllable. Yes. You don't even have to believe it. And yet it's amazing in this story that every single individual, and they had old folks, they had children, they had parents, every single one apparently died bravely. They were martyred because they felt the spirit telling them, I will not, I will not deny my Lord. And all of them were killed. I... I have to say that people with authentic faith are in the world, but I've become very discouraged at the fact that maybe they're not in the Western church because faith is getting to be hard to find. And I hear these stories and they're amazing. And sometimes even Christians look at that and they shake their head and say, well, that's not how I would have acted. But I think of Thomas Aquinas, the great uh, Christian philosopher, theologian who said to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. And to one without faith, no explanation is possible. I think that when we think about those authentic Christians in that bus, no explanation was necessary. They would not deny Jesus Christ. They would not in any way be subject to anything other than Christ. And then to many of us without faith, there's no explanation possible. We look at it as a kind of foolishness. 
You know, the hardest words that Jesus ever spoke, and I've been thinking about this a lot, are probably also the sweetest words he ever spoke. And that is, as the children were coming to him, the disciples tried to shoo them away. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. In another gospel, Jesus says, unless you become as a little child, you have no part in the kingdom of heaven. Well, what do these children have that Jesus says they've got that we lack? Well, I'll tell you, it's really simple. They, they have a beautiful thing called faith. A child has faith. And I am becoming more and more convinced as I read the New Testament that faith is absolutely the essential vehicle that the Lord uses for us to accept his grace. Faith is essential. Now, the great Martin Luther, the great uh, reformer, was doing something that very few people in his day could do because they weren't capable of it. He was reading the scriptures. You see, he started out as just a lowly monk, but he worked his way up and became a doctor of theology. He was an expert in biblical matters, and he was reading from Romans chapter 1. And if you've read the book of Romans, the entire book is about faith. The only other book that I think talks about faith more would be the book of Hebrews. But he was reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and he came to this verse it says for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed absolutely true we would all agree with that and then it says a righteousness that is by faith from first to last just as it, as it is written the righteous live by faith this shook him so much because this is not what he had been taught in the monastery. This is not what he had been taught in the, the seminary that he had gone to. This is a, a righteousness that can't be bought by your works. This is a righteousness that cannot be bought by indulgences. This is a righteousness that comes by faith and faith alone. And from there, the whole world changed because Martin Luther started on a journey of reading the gospel and discovering faith, salvation by grace through faith. As a matter of fact, after he had read through the gospels, after he'd read through the, the epistles of Paul, there's that famous moment in 1517 when he walked up to the castle church and he nailed on the door there in Wittenberg his 95 theses. If you've ever read his 95 theses, and these were 95 truths that he felt that the church had gotten wrong. But if you read them, they're almost all about faith and the lack of faith in the church and the lack of emphasis on faith. Ah, faith is essential, friends. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, and this is the message. I like how it puts it. It says the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. That sounds like it's pretty important. Now, Martin Luther began to explore this. What exactly is faith? We had this discussion in our own Bible class on Wednesday night. What is faith? Here's what Martin Luther said, and I really like it. He says, faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace. So certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. Did you notice that? This is more than just a belief in God. 
this is a, a belief and a trust in God's grace that God is good, that God has good intentions for us. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy, joyful, and bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. The Holy Spirit makes this happen through faith, not our works. The Holy Spirit makes it happen because of it, because of this faith, you freely, willingly, and joyfully do good to everyone. Serve everyone, suffer all kinds of things, love and praise the God who has shown you such grace. Thus, listen to this part. Thus, it is just as impossible to separate faith and works as it is to separate heat and light from fire. Faith is something that is far more than just belief. It's a transformation. That's why I think the argument that we've been having for 2,000 years about faith versus works is really just the ultimate red herring. Now, a red herring is a logical fallacy often intentionally used, and it essentially is an argument meant to distract from the real point. I think we've been distracted from the real point when we've been talking about faith versus works. And so you ask, what is the real point? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us, he says, it is impossible to please God without faith. That sounds pretty important. And that's the point. And anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists but notice that's not the end, because even the devils believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It's not just a belief that he is. It's also a belief in who he is, that he is a good God, that he is a good God with a good heart whose intentions are good and that he has the best in mind for each of us. And therefore, the people on that bus know that even as they stand there in the face of those guns, they know that their God is a good God with a good heart who has their best intentions at heart and they can face death a thousand times over. Oh, I love that last line, that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So when I try to define faith, I like to think of it this way. First of all, what faith is not. Faith does not just trust that one can cross a chasm. Imagine yourself looking out over a chasm, thinking, you know what? I could get on this line, on this rope, and I could walk across. Faith does not just trust that you could do that. No, it's more than that. Faith is a life lived that actually crosses chasms as if it already has. That is different. That is absolutely different. And if it sounds like foolishness, well, scripture tells us that it will sound like foolishness to the wise, but it's that sort of foolishness that Christ wants from us. It's that sort of foolishness that Christ says gives us access to grace. It's that sort of foolishness that a little child has. It's that sort of foolishness that can explain how a saint can sing in prison. And that sort of foolishness is how the martyr can worship Christ at the burning stake. That sort of foolishness is how the believer says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of Christ. Amen. Now, faith, faith has benefits. Faith has so many benefits. So I've talked about it being important. Absolutely, it's important. What are the benefits? Well, I, I could talk all day about that. But first and foremost, faith in Christ and from Christ. And notice it's both. It's a belief in Christ and that belief comes from Christ. 
Faith in Christ and from Christ is how Jesus gives us life forever. That's the vehicle, really. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. No, it's the result of the grace of God and a belief in that grace. Belief enough to reach out and take it. But there's more. Faith also in Christ and from Christ gives us the believer victory over sin. Sin is something that absolutely brings us down. It, if, if you've been an addict, and I have been an addict before, I'm an alcoholic, I know what it is to have the, the sin on you and you can't seem to overcome it. It was faith in Jesus alone that gave me the victory. He gets all the credit, and that is the case for everyone. It doesn't mean perfection. But it does mean that you could have victory. You could have victory over the thing that torments you. Victory over that addiction to pornography. Victory over that pride that gets in your way. Oh, John tells us in his letter, he says, His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Why? Because remember, Jesus has overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, only the one who believes, not that he exists, but that he is who he says he is, a good God, a good God. And when we've seen him, we've seen the Father. But there's more, more benefits. Faith in Christ and from Christ can heal the sick. Tell me, when was the last time you laid your hands on someone and they were healed? I don't see that in the Western world. Maybe it's because we lack faith. It's happening, though, in various parts of the world. Not only that, faith in Christ and from Christ gives the believer power over demons. Oh, we don't like to talk about that very much. You know, that sounds a little out there. That's we're starting to get a little Pentecostal. No, we're just starting to talk a little bit about Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Jesus sent his disciples out, he gave them very specific instructions. First of all, he told them to preach the kingdom of God, that it was at hand. And then he told them this, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. How often do we see that in our ministry today? I'm going to tell you right now, almost never. I think we have a tremendous lack of faith right now. <sighs> Why don't we see these things? Well, Jesus said, because the disciples asked when they tried to cast a demon out of a boy and they just couldn't do it. And Jesus, in frustration, told them this. He said, remember, he says, because you're not yet taking God seriously. That's why you can't do it. Is that us? Because you're not taking God seriously. The simple truth is, he says, that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a, a poppy seed, he says a mustard seed, but, but uh, Peter said here translates it as poppy seed, it's a little tiny seed. If you just have that much, you would tell this mountain, move, and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. Do we have that kind of faith? I'm going to say no. And I'm going to say it with confidence and sadness because I don't see it in the Western Christian church. I just don't see it. But there's more. Faith, faith is also a beautiful thing that many of us have experienced because faith in Christ and from Christ transforms a life utterly. There is no greater miracle of transformation in the world that I can think of than the transformation of a caterpillar into a chrysalis. And in that chrysalis, all of its cells seem to rearrange themselves. And that 
creature comes out a beautiful butterfly. That is a miracle. But you know what? Faith does that with us as well. Absolutely. Second Corinthians says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory justice from the Lord the Spirit. So think about that for a moment. We have the ability to be transformed in the same way, only more glorious as going from a worm to a beautiful creature that can fly because of faith. Amen. Now the disciples, the disciples heard Jesus talk about this. They, Jesus often chastised them for a lack of faith. And they said, please increase our faith, Lord, show us how. And Jesus told them and gave them instructions. I'm going to share them. One is get in the word get in the word spend time getting to know the God who is worthy of our trust the God whose heart is a good heart that has the best intentions for us get in the word and I don't mean find out how many frums are in the Bible I don't mean uh, go through and see if you can identify irrelevant things I'm talking about get to know Jesus in the word Get to know Jesus in the Word. Study with each other. Study with yourself. How much time are you spending each day in the Word? Not just in the Scripture, but also in other individuals who've written beautiful things that point us to the Word. Get in the Word, but not just get in the Word, because getting in the Word is a beautiful thing. And Deuteronomy says, like Jeremiah says, and we also see it in the New Testament, that you will find Him if you seek Him with all all your heart and with all your soul you do that by getting into the word but not only that act on the word don't just read it but internalize it and act on it oh I love the James a book that I'm falling in love with he says that we will find delight and affirmation of our faith by being doers of the word. It's not enough to study the word. I have been with great scholars of scripture. When I was in grad school, I had a great, great instructor. It was at a secular university, maybe one of the greatest uh, theologians, one of the greatest people I've ever seen in his knowledge of biblical Hebrew. He was not a believer in God. He'd been in the Word, but it didn't transform him. But by being doers of the Word, it will increase your faith. Do good and watch your faith grow. And then, of course, pray. Pray and pray. Jesus would tell his disciples, pray. How many times does Scripture tell us, pray? Talk to the Lord. Get to know Him. Get to know the God who has a heart for you. Get to know His voice. Get to know a God that wants nothing but the best for you. So faith matters. It's foolishness to the wise. And it's life transforming to the authentic believer. And the one who has faith... No explanations are necessary. But to the one without faith, everything I'm saying right now sounds like gibberish. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you to explore faith, to ask each other, how's your faith? How is your faith? Is it growing? Help each other grow in their faith. And by that, I mean not just their belief and not just their growth in a denomination. I'm talking about a belief in a God who loves us passionately because he does. He is a good God. He is worthy of our belief. I think of the great Bill Walsh, the football uh, coach. And when he was building the San Francisco 49ers who had had years 
years of losing seasons. He said, one of the things I want to teach you is to play as if you have already won. I thought, that's almost spiritual because Christ asks us to go about our lives as if we have already won because we have. Jesus has won and we need to go about with a faith that not only believes that we can do, do it, but a life that actually acts upon it because we know we will and we do. I want to encourage you to visit our website, which is newcreationsga.org. Uh, we've begun to post sermons there, and I don't mean this to be any sort of a commercial for some of the things we have on here, but I encourage you, get to know Jesus. And if I could point something to you, it would be the sermon that, that I did just a couple weeks ago called God is no scrawny twig. Get to know that Jesus, the Jesus who has power. So how's your faith, friend? How's your faith? Is it transforming you? Is it giving you the courage to do what God has asked you to do? Is it encouraging you to obey him? Is it encouraging you to help others? Is, are you beginning to see amazing things take place because the spirit of God is at work? How's your faith? We're going to keep talking about this. But my friend, Western Christianity is in desperate need of authentic faith. So when the question comes to you, are you a Christian? I hope you say, yes, I am an ardent, I am a fervent, I am a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, you are a good God. You have a good heart. And you mean only good for us. And even when the world seems to turn upside down as it is now, you have a plan for us. And you, you have good intentions for us. So Lord, we call on you, just as the disciples did, to increase our faith. Maybe we, may we be like the man who said, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And let my life be transformed by faith. And may we claim your grace with the vehicle of faith. Because without the faith, we, we don't have even the ambition to reach out to you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the victory of grace. And thank you for the gift of grace, of, of faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Have a wonderful day. And my friends, call on Jesus today and ask him what the disciples asked. Please, Lord, increase my faith. Hey everyone, I know we're not meeting in the church, but remember, the church is not a building. The church is a body of believers. And we're meeting, even if we don't meet in a building, but we have expenses. And so I wanna encourage you to give. And there are several ways that you can give to the ministry of the New Creation Community Church. One of the ways is you can go to our website and right there at the top, you have a way that you can give online. And that's a wonderful and safe way that you can give. And the church budget goes directly to the ministry of our church. It goes to our Sabbath schools. It goes to our mortgage. It goes to our youth activities. It goes to our women's activities. It goes to even the prayer garden that we're working on. It goes to all all of the things that make this church unique and I encourage you to give in that way uh, if you have something specific you want to give to you can do that right there online we're a part of a global church and you can also give to tithe and that goes to our conference here the Nebraska uh, Kansas conference conference it also goes to our world church and I also would encourage you if you if you don't uh, trust those or if you want to looking for just the traditional away, you can mail it to our address, which is 5610. 
oh sorry 5620 south coddington avenue here in lincoln nebraska so you can mail it you can find that right on our website and i encourage you to do so thank you so much the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and give you grace